Yeah. Lon and I were talking about the 49ers in a much different way than Jennifer is talking about the 49ers. <laughs> <laughs> Sponsor, <not the fire. laughs> Okay. Y'all set? We're ready. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and call the order. Do you want to call the roll? Yes. Council Member Fleming, Mayor Rogers, present, and Chair Rogers. Here. Okay, let the record reflect that all council members are present with the exception of Council Member Fleming. All right, we've got some minutes from December 6th. Did you have any changes to this? Let's go to public comments, see if anybody had any corrections on the minutes from December 6th. All right, seeing none, we'll show those adopted as presented unless there's objection. Let's go to public comment for non-agenda items. Yes, I have something. Yeah, please do. I'll go ahead, just sit right here, okay? Yep. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. I've been following these kinds of topics for decades. I brought you a little shirt to see that uh, University of British Columbia up in Canada, they're big on trees. And they give out this shirt up there. Trees are my life. <laughs> so over in Roseland, we got some trees left, and I've been talking about how to save them for years. This is a US EPA document from 1992, 32 years ago, pointing out how to do uh, tree planting and light colored surfacing to have cooling our communities, all right? So I picked that up along the way because we were talking about how do we save these trees and then get even more trees in our area. Most of you may not know this, but there actually used to be a scenic roadway in Roseland on Burbank Avenue. And we worked on it for like 20 something years, got it to be called a scenic roadway about 20 years ago. Then a school district put a school over there and cut down most of the trees and everything's changed up. But the reason I bring it up is because um, in this document from the EPA 30 something years ago, they pointed out that researchers have found that trees in urban areas can significantly enhance our sense of well being. And that's a really important thing as you go with climate action and climate adaptation. People need to know that they're going to have a spot where they can get a break from the heat. Um, the Sonoma County Transportation Authority and the Regional Climate Protection Authority put out this recent document. And they're looking into funding for climate work and they're doing different things along these ways. Natural climate solutions. It's really kind of basic. How about we just save all the trees we have and plant more and then the ones that come down, we replace them. So we really like to see that start to happen over along an area in our uh, neighborhood called Roseland Creek. And basically each of the developments that's coming forward they're taking the trees down because that's how you develop. They try to clear all the land flat and then go in and put new stuff in. And then you plant trees and you wait 30, 40 years to get the positives. I'd like for you folks in this committee to at least look at the idea of saving the trees. There used to actually be uh, some construction methods where they protected trees instead of them cutting them down like they did just now for what they call Burbank Avenue apartments. They destroyed a grove of redwoods. Not good. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dwayne. Anybody else for public comment? <clears throat> All right. We'll move on then to department reports. Great. Um, wanted to let you know from um, the water department that uh, staff has begun planning for our Earth Day event on April 20th. And it's the usual time from 12 to 4 in Courthouse Square. And we'll have live performances and talk about ways to go green. There will be the usual kids activities and, of course, local food and drink. Um, and then in April, we'll have staff coming before council and BPU to provide the full regular presentation with all the wonderful details. So just wanted to give you a heads up that um, our work has begun on that. So great. That's Thank it. you. See if there's any comment on the department report. Yes, <laughs> we got an Earth Day over in Roseland also. And last year, the mayor of Santa Rosa came out and spent two hours 
along Roseland Creek helping us out. That's as rare as chicken's teeth, folks. I mean, that was just amazing. So thank you very much. We'll be doing it again, 10 to 12, so anybody can come from there by their bicycle, of course, over to here for your downtown Santa Rosa events. Thank you kindly. Great. Thank you, Dwayne. Let's go on to then item 5.1. All right, great. Today, 5.1, we have the Parking Division Electric Vehicle Projects Update, and that'll be presented by Chad Hedge, um, the Parking Manager and Finance Department. Somewhere. Yeah. Unless you can find it quicker, it is a sick. Okay, maybe we will need your help. <laughs> not seeing it now. They should have watched you, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> And then you can use there. Thank you. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, Councilman Rogers. I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, briefly about uh, the projects that are coming forward with parking regarding the EV implementation. Pretty excited about some things we have going on. So we've got two. Two major projects going on right now, Lot 10, which is the lot right behind Russian River Brewery. Uh, we've got a, a project that's been approved through PG&E, been approved through the city attorney's office. We've got the EV chargers ordered uh, and they're on their way and we're waiting on a switch gear, but we got approved um, funding through the PG&E Rule 29 program. So they're gonna pay to upgrade the, uh, the service, uh, put in a new transformer, then city staff, electrical and parking, we're gonna work on getting the EV chargers installed. And so we're hoping by maybe midsummer, we're gonna be able to have 12 or six dual port level two EV chargers in that lot available for public use. Um, so that, that that's gonna be a really, really good thing. We originally had a project planned for lot 10 that we were gonna completely redo the lot. Um, but with uh, funding and, and, and other concerns, and we would end up losing some spaces, and then the original plans didn't include any kind of EV infrastructure. We've kind of pivoted to where we worked with PG&E, and now we're gonna redo the lot, make it prettier, but also have uh, 12 EV chargers, so that'll be a good one. Garage 9, which is the garage right here behind us, uh, also through PG&E, through the EV fleet program, uh, we were able to get uh, some additional uh, resources. They're also going to upgrade the infrastructure, install a new transformer, and we're going to have, uh, once again, six dual port level two EV chargers installed in that garage. Those will be specifically for fleet use because it's part of the EV fleet program. Uh, but until we have until 2029 to purchase the, to replace parking vehicles based on their grants. So um, until then, they can be used for public use, but at a certain point, they'll be cut off and only be allowed for fleet use. Uh, we, like I mentioned, we've been working on this since 2019 where we allocated the funds to redo the entire lot. Um, and once, I, once again, although the, the engineered plans had conduit in the ground for future EV implementation, they didn't correlate with any of the existing transformers or where we thought we'd want to put the, the charger. So we ultimately we would have had to dig it all up and start over um, regardless. And then the garage nine one, uh, once again, we've had this project, uh, JL created for this project. So we do improvements on the garage as often as possible. 
uh, but we were able to find the funds through pg e to go ahead and help us push through with this EV fleet program, which is for us huge. We, parking, we only have 13 total vehicles. So for us being so small, it's gonna be really easy to get our infrastructure in place for our, our vehicles, unlike other departments who have way more than, than 13 vehicles. And since I spoke, started this, it actually has been approved. Uh, the garage 12 one is not, so garage 12 is the, the Roxy Theater garage. Uh, I've, I sent over an agreement with, with Tesla um, it's, and it's, it's in approval or in a, being a, evaluated right now. So Tesla, because they don't have any large, their words, any large supercharger stations in the city of Santa Rosa, they would 100% fund the entire project to pay for any kind of uh, pg e upgrades. They'll do all the application. They'll install all of the chargers. Um, we won't have to do anything but, but uh, uh, do city permitting to get to that point. Uh, so we're kind of seeing if that works. If that works, then we can go from having Right now, parking has nine chargers between Courthouse Square, uh, but we can end up with uh, 102 EV public use chargers uh, funded with very little money ready ready to go. So uh, we'll I'm keeping up on that one to see how that comes out. With everything that's going on, even if it, it comes back, PG, or, uh, Tesla and PG&E, I'm on their timetable now. So I gotta wait till they say they have the time, then they'll schedule these projects. But uh, big point we, we've always tried to do uh, parking as we're talking about these things is we understand the big push is always to reduce the, the, the VMTs, the vehicle miles traveled, right? We understand the GHG reduction strategy. We understand the cities, the county and the state are, are, are focusing really hard on uh, the climate action plans and, and developments are coming in with uh, uh, no parking requirements because we want to try to get more people out on the ground. But we also want to try to get more availability for EV chargers before this whole, um, before we get too far down the road. So these are some of the things that we, we're gonna benefit by going this direction that kind of tie into the MTC funded study that we're doing. Um, and that will you know, better utilize it. I don't know if I talked about that. We finally got the grant funding from, from MC, MTC this week. I, I just found out about this. And so we were notified that a group called Sam Schwartz Consulting Engineers is going to start in two weeks with this this major uh, study and evaluation. We didn't know when the money was going to come because last time I, I spoke with MTC, they thought it, well, I wouldn't get it started until late summer. So this is exciting for us. But this study is going to incorporate everything. And I've been talking with TP and Debbie. They got a study coming on to add more bike lanes and, and things like that. So we're going to try to do it together. But we need to utilize what we have a little bit better, especially with all the changes coming in. Uh, downtown, whether we're talking about garages, lots, or street parking, we need to use them better uh, and adjust to the new normal, uh, reduce the GHGs and VMTs, ensure the implementation of, of the EV charger for public and fleet use. If I can get the Tesla thing going, I think we're going to be ahead of the curve and, and we'll be able to focus less on that because we'll be we'll have more than enough. Um, facilities, uh, I think we can use our, our facilities a little bit better. Uh, the parking facilities as far as maybe opening up to not just a, a, a parking facility, a dark parking facility, but maybe maybe community events, uh, maybe uh, 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 spaces for theaters, uh, movie night weekends, or, or a park on top. There, I think there's tons of options, although it doesn't sound exciting when I say it, but I think there's a lot of things that we can do with our garages to better suit the city. Um, streamline operations to improvement to aging facilities. I think everybody in the city is kind of figuring out a way how we can improve our facilities uh, uh, and bring them up to, to current standards and also make sure it's a benefit to the city. Uh, the community outreach is going to be significant with this study because of where we're at now compared to three years ago. We, we don't, we're not, we can utilize our spaces better to, to accompany what the new focus of the city is going to be. So just going forward and as part of this big MTC study we're doing with the multiple, multiple community engagement meetings and uh, stakeholders, city stakeholders, anybody who wants to be involved or needs to be involved. You know, we want to really focus on what, what the concern is regarding parking, right? Um, 
we want to discuss uh, interactions, uh, uh, guests and business owners. What, what do they want? What do they look to see when they come downtown? How can we help them out? Uh, what's the need? And depending on the Tesla thing for more EV chargers and infrastructure upgrades, just because we get some down here, it, it doesn't touch Railroad Square. It doesn't touch anywhere outside of the downtown area, which is which is outside of, of my purview. But um, how can it be incorporated to where this can be a destination to know that there's tons of EV chargers and we have maybe micro mobility stations set up, uh, more of the scooter and bike share set up, transit options set up so we can get people down here and then let them uh, travel around. Um, and then just how, how uh, what options when we talk to these community meetings, what, what's required to gain the support of the businesses, the stakeholders and things like that as far as parkings end when we start having these bigger, bigger conversations about the study. And then I think you guys all have my contact information. And that's all I have on the EV implementation. All right, any questions? No, you come bearing great news. Good. Love it. Good. Um, also, when you were talking about the better uh, utilization of our mm -hmm. existing facilities, mm -hmm. when we had the Mary Lou reveal mm -hmm. over in the um, city hall, the parking lot. Yeah. I was yeah. thinking when we had that, like, why don't we use our facilities mm -hmm. more for community events and things like that? So yeah. I think that your department is definitely right on the money. Cool. I appreciate that. A lot, a lot of questions I got to get figured out, but thank you. Yeah. Uh, for lot 10, mm -hmm. you, uh, for the other lots, you kind of mentioned Tesla was going to be the operator mm -hmm. for, for their charge mm -hmm. stations. Who's the operator going to be for lot 10? The city, parking. It, so it will yeah. be the city. Yeah, we will own and operate the chargers in, in those two. Um, and the reason, uh, t so Tesla reached out to me. I, I guess that they, was nine. There are going to be nine chargers there? In, in lot 10, okay. there'll be six dual port chargers. Well, same in, same in uh, garage nine. Mm -hmm. If we go through with Tesla, I can get up to 120 chargers. But um, we're probably looking 90 to 120, or we, we can adjust that down. So will it be will the charge stations themselves then be free for people to use, or is the city going to come up with a, a mechanism for charging people for the electricity? The my assumption, because we haven't got anything approved yet from Tesla, is that it'll be the setup the same as the charge point right now. Oh no, sorry, I mean for lot 10. Oh, it'll be the same no. as the city. It'll be it'll be paid by the same as the ones in Courthouse Square. I think it's two dollars to start your charge and then ten, at first four hours, I think is free and then $10 per hour after those four hours. But I think the ones on courthouse square, I think are charge point, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So is, so charge point's gonna do lot 10? Correct. Lot okay, 10 gotcha. Garage nine. Cool. Yeah. Okay, have you talked with Sonoma Clean Power at all about this yet? Yeah, we've had a lot of conversations with with uh, with Brant, you right, talked to them a lot about that. They're very excited about it. They've helped me apply for different communities in charge grants mm -hmm. that could help offset the costs. Great. So they've been a, a great, a great resource. Cool. And then uh, have you had discussions with the businesses that are served by lot 10 about any potential disruptions or what that timeline might look like? I have. So um, uh, Rush, the owner of the Russian River, we've had a lot of conversations that she brought all the business owners in, including the, uh, the, the business uh, uh, manager or the mm -hmm. facility manager back when we started talking about the construction yeah so they're they're pleased because originally we were going to, have to shut down the entire lot to do right. the project whereas now there'll be very little impact and they'll get chargers out of this so they're extremely excited they're glad it's not going this way the one thing that they ask is make sure i i, I look out for piney the elder and do not disrupt <laughs> that i respect that yeah, yeah. me too yeah. yeah cool all right let's see if there's any questions from the public All right. All right. Thanks All right. so much. I'm really looking forward to it. I Perfect. think uh, I think if we can get to the point where we can boast that we have 100 electric vehicle chargers downtown, uh, you know, I, so my wife and I, we drive an electric vehicle and uh, there are specific spots that it does lead to economic development when we're on our way to Sacramento and have to stop in Vacaville for a few minutes and yeah. stop off in the businesses that are there. So I think being able to market downtown as an EV friendly place, is a great thing for us. I agree. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to item 5.2. Thank you, Brian. Um, item 5.2, a FEMA flood risk mapping project. 
So from a very good item to a probably perhaps a little bit more depressing item. <laughs> or oh, opportunity. Or opportunity. <laughs> the city to adapt to climate change. Yeah. <laughs> So we've got Claire Myers, our stormwater and creeks manager uh, from Santa Rosa Water, and Jesse Oswald, chief building official, planning and economic development department. No, no, one at a time. We believe in you, Jesse. Yeah. Oh, that's why. <laughs> yeah. But the, because each Let's car see. has a different type of plug. We're here for two different types. Got it. Yeah, yeah. You can tell I don't have a Tesla. <laughs> Oh, Tess is a third different type. This is cool. It's its own part. Yeah. So then will other people besides Tesla be able to charge on the 102 charging stations or just Tesla? Not on the two chargers. So we're just going to have the electric chargers. So a lot of the companies have just reached an agreement with Tesla so that their new cars that are coming in will also be able to accept the Tesla ports. Sorry, we're so excited about the EV charging system. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, Mayor Rogers, Chair Rogers, very excited to be here. Um, thank you for having us to speak about a topic that has great relevance for climate, climate, no, climate resilience and adaptation in Santa Rosa. Um, we're here today to discuss FEMA's flood risk mapping project for the Santa Rosa Creek watershed. Um, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, is responsible for mapping our country's flood risk um, and for helping communities develop strategies for um, improving resiliency. So FEMA has identified Santa Rosa Creek watershed um, for a map update. So I'm here with Jesse Oswald today, our floodplain administrator. Um, and today we'll just provide you an overview of the project, um, what it is, project benefits and impacts. Um, we'll go over FEMA's project timeline um, and also how Santa Rosa Water, Planning and Economic Development, and Communications and Intergovernmental Relations are working together um, to ensure a really comprehensive public outreach. So, we'll start by explaining the foundation of the project. What is flood risk mapping? Um, and simply put, it's FEMA's maps that show areas that have a high likelihood of flooding. Um, more specifically, FEMA is using modeling data to identify flood hazard areas that have a 1% chance of flooding, uh, also known as a 100-year flood. Um, and basically, the mapping creates a series of statistical lines that identify flood risk on a parcel-by-parcel -parcel basis uh, within a watershed. So for this study, um, FEMA is developing the maps for the Santa Rosa Creek watershed. As we've said, uh, you can see the boundaries of this watershed on the map that we've provided here or within that purple line. Um, the analysis includes Santa Rosa Creek and all its key tributaries, um, which encompass most of the city, which is the gray outline, um, and then as well as some unincorporated areas in Sonoma County. So why is this important? Um, because in order for property owners and also for the city to make decisions on how to best mitigate risk, we really need to know what that risk is. Um, mapping areas for high flood risk can help property owners make decisions about things like land use, um, purchasing appropriate insurance to mitigate losses in a flood event, uh, and helping the city identify capital improvement projects um, for us to better protect our community. And then why now? Um, because flood risks change over time and new and better data become available. Um, when new flood risks and data are identified, FEMA will start the process of updating their flood maps. Um, there's no set timeline for revising flood maps um, and they typically occur when more accurate engineering information becomes available either through a FEMA funded restudy or when a community makes new information available to FEMA. So um, when it gets more into the details of when, when this mapping starts happening and, and at the current point we're definitely preliminary but eventually we're going to have this well-defined area of these these one percent or greater chance of, of flooding. Um, so when we, we have that happen, they're identified, and FEMA has very specific criteria on how they're identified, and then what happens afterwards. Um, so depending on um, where these properties are 
and what someone might do with a property. So we're talking post map adoption with some of this information here. It becomes much more stringent to develop in a uh, identified flood hazard area and insurance rates uh, do do increase. Uh, fortunately, you both voted on an ordinance less than two years ago that updated our local floodplain administrative ordinance that puts us in very good standing with FEMA. There's a FEMA sponsored insurance rate program. In fact, the maps are called flood insurance rate maps. Um, so the city is in, in a good position to leverage assistance through FEMA for folks that are gonna need this insurance. So the insurance possibilities and development um, requirements will significantly change in those areas. And when we get farther down the road, many folks that will be in those areas are gonna have a lot of questions that that will defer to realistically the building division when permitting is needed, uh, those kinds of things. Um, also talking about the, the FEMA assistance with uh, insurance, flood insurance, uh, mortgages, generally speaking, if you're in a flood zone require flood insurance. So there's private insurance that we hear so much about these days. And then FEMA has a program also that can be more beneficial than the, the, the private um, uh, insurance uh, path. And again, we're on a really good path already with FEMA. In fact, we're doing an, a, a brand new revised update of our ordinance as we speak. Oddly enough, while this is going on, uh, FEMA reached out to me and said, send me your latest um, ordinance so we can verify it meets the federal and, and state requirements for all of the laws and requirements. So again, it, some of these things are not necessarily happening because the other's happening. It, again, much like what Claire was indicating, it's just some of it's FEMA's timeline. So again, the temporary and ongoing impacts, staff workload, definitely due to this outreach that is gonna continue to be more and more robust, we're gonna get a lot more questions. So we're working on uh, already establishing a web page and contact information for individuals who can answer the questions and make sure that folks that do have these questions get to someone who can walk them through what it really could mean to them now. So the first question is gonna be, if I end up with this, what's it gonna mean to me? And then farther down the road, okay, now I know I'm in this, what does it really mean for me? So that that's part of this additional impact. And then after adoption, uh, significantly more work is involved in developing in those, those areas with the extra documentation that folks that are developing have to do and then city staff have to do to confirm compliance with the federal requirements for what has to be done during development. So, Uh, yeah, again, along what I was saying, um, because we're getting this out in front, folks that may be contemplating doing additional work to a property they own or even looking at a property to purchase, this will help them make those decisions with as much information as we can give them, uh, at least an idea up front on, on what it, it will mean to them. Um, so again, it, it helps us in what we're doing now, identify those areas that that are likely going to be impacted. How do we project for the city itself? How do we project for staffing to address those things that will be will be impacted? And then developers, again, future development, whether it be city alone or private developers, have tools to make those decisions with. And overall, the the, the whole scope of this is to make sure that, that you know the safety of our community and citizens is the ultimate outcome that we're, we're after here. Uh, so as far as FEMA's project timeline, the, the flood risk mapping is a multi-step, multi-year process that includes FEMA coordinating with local officials, technical staff, and the public. Um, Jesse and I will walk you through each of FEMA's steps. Um, and it's important to note, though, that throughout the process, the city is also going to be needing to communicate with a large number of our stakeholders as well, including FEMA and local officials, regional partners, and then our impacted community members. Um, so to help our community navigate FEMA's project, as Jesse was saying, um, a comprehensive outreach plan was developed by community, or sorry, communications and intergovernmental relations office um, with Santa Rosa Water and planning and economic development, so. 
The first phase of FEMA's process is called discovery. Um, FEMA is currently wrapping up their discovery phase now. Um, and in this phase, FEMA is gathering local flood data and institutional knowledge from local agencies. Um, they do this in close coordination with the community um, to prioritize future mapping, do risk assessment and mitigation planning. So the city of Santa Rosa, along with Sonoma Water and the county of Sonoma have been working closely with FEMA already um, to provide them with data from the Santa Rosa Creek flood study um, that was recently completed. And then FEMA will use the local data um, as well as their own data in the next phase of the project. So we are just entering this phase two um, analysis and mapping. As I was saying, during this phase, FEMA uses the information they gather during discovery, um, along with their own data to develop preliminary flood maps uh, for the Santa Rosa Creek watershed. Um, FEMA won't just use the city's flood study. They will take that information and then do their own analysis to develop these preliminary maps. Um, so the work should begin officially on that this month, or it, it has actually begun, um, and it's estimated to take about a year for this analysis and initial mapping process to happen. So the preliminaries get released, so that really more refines the, the boundaries of what we're going to be, be discussing. And then um, with FEMA's engagement, the, we have more, which you can expect a pretty robust support from the city staff and all the stakeholders as well. Um, those maps get released, uh, they're public, publicly consumed. That gives the community an opportunity to review and then provide uh, comments, so to speak, much like we do in any of our adoption type processes. Uh, so that is the very specific 90 day period. Uh, FEMA does have a very uh, uh, specialized criteria on their commenting that our team will be versed on, on what it means when somebody calls and says, I wanna provide comment on this, we'll, we'll provide the links and, and tools for them to, to, to work through FEMA's tools to make sure that those things are uh, done in the appropriate manner so people are heard, uh, the community is heard accurately. So that's gonna be one of our roles is to, again, inform the public to, to make sure those tools are available, that, that we're, they're at the ready for us to provide uh, for folks. And again, uh, summer 2025, we'll hope that FEMA can hold to that timeline. And we're, we'll have a lot of work between now and then uh, to be ready for that, but it's gonna be ongoing. When FEMA sends essentially after the 90 day period, they have a period of time to where they analyze all the data, respond, or actually make official responses to any comments that are properly formatted and that they, they deem that they are required to respond to. Then the, the maps are literally provided, which uh, sometimes use the mayor are literally sent things directly from FEMA as the mayor former mayor as well, you know, uh, directly from FEMA saying, we, we have a final determination and here's where you can find the map. So that's when um, we have that, uh, we're almost at the end and then any, any of that collected data that may amend a map, we're almost to a point where it has to happen by that last stage. And then again, that's not, you know, anticipating a, a mid-2025 finish to an early 2026. So that period is when any changes would be happening to that, that last data that appears to be the, the solidified maps. So timeline that FEMA's provided us is quite a range, spring 2026 to 2027, depending on if there are significant changes or not. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out, especially for a community here that is really, um, I, I don't know that we could say enjoyed not being in a flood zone for such a long period of time and with all the changes in the weather and the, the data that Claire uh, deferred to on what's in, imposing it, it, it you know, they're, it's going to make significant changes and it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out through the next essentially two years. This is the the pretty early but pretty robust already uh, list of resources we have to uh, get folks engaged. Um, 
the information sites, phone numbers, and this is a combination or the, the lead agency FEMA, their direct contact information that folks can actually go and look up this project already to see what's happening since it's official. Um, and then the city of Santa Rosa establishing our, our site, then newsletters, people, folks like many of our initiatives can sign up for it uh, for regular updates, those kinds of things. And we continue to develop a list of FAQs. Uh, the team continues to communicate on what have you heard? What's your experience with these types of things? And what are you hearing? Uh, and providing, uh, you know, hopefully as much uh, of a robust list as we can to, to have people help themselves, but also, again, the contact information for our team to have somebody to be able to reach out to. This is an easy one for me. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> I have an awful lot of them. Fair. Um, so thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we have fire zones, we have flood zones, like people can be in both, like it's just a lot going on in our beautiful city. My question is, is um, if your house is determined to be in a, in a flood zone, will it decrease the value of your home or like are, are there, um, like one is very bad, three is okay. You know, like, because I we get emails that say, you know, I'm in a fire zone. I can't get insurance. I can't sell my house. Right. Right. Because no one can buy, get a mortgage on a house if they can't um, get the insurance. So I'm wondering how this will go with um, the flood, even if we do have the, the FEMA mm -hmm. insurance. So I'll ask if I'll, I'll answer from a theoretical perspective. It's Please. not something that we have included in much of our research and preparation but the realism of that is certainly there mm -hmm. we're experiencing it now with fire insurance um, we may consider and the team can correct me that we should have a good conversation with the board of realtors um, in our discussions in what this really means i i think that would be a really great resource for us they, they would be the pros to be able to answer that question for us i believe how we support our residents. Yeah, and I would add to, for some of these questions like that, FEMA so far has been a really great partner um, and has offered, their staff have offered to come to some of our public meetings and answer some of those, those questions that are a little bit outside the realm of maybe our technical expertise, but where they know the answers and they know what other communities have experienced. And so we'll definitely be um, inviting FEMA staff to be representing at the, at the meetings. Okay. I don't, sorry. Flannery Banks, the stormwater engineer for Santa Rosa, uh, specifically to the insurance, uh, flood insurance is federally uh, operated and handled. So we don't have the same concern that because they're identifying the flood risk that they'll be rejected. Or I know that insurance providers are for fire are pulling out of California. That's not the same concern because it's all the main program for it's all administered and operated by the federal oh, government. Perfect. Thank you. You're that welcome. is the answer. Thank you. Bring the engineer. <laughs> Always bring the engineer. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that was a great question. And uh, the only other thing that I'll add is just thanking Congressman Thompson's office for their work. Cause I know that they've been very engaged with FEMA also throughout this whole process and will continue to be. Uh, and I know uh, Congressman Huffman doesn't represent Santa Rosa, but his his team has been involved as well. So I just want to thank them for that. Let's go to the public to see if there's any public comments. Okay. I'll bring it back to say thank you. And I know we're going to get more updates as this moves forward uh, in the, the coming year, I, I suppose. So. All right. Uh, we have item six, that's future agenda items that we provided for information. Let's see if there's any public comment on item number six. Seeing none, we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.